to Mind Crime Liberty Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we're joined by Terminal Philosophy to discuss the problems of history. So Tim, what are the problems of history? Today I'd like to discuss three issues which to me are problems for historical analysis, analyses and analyses in general. The broad three topics will be one, lack of data, two, propaganda, and three, competing narratives. Um, I made a I made a I want to start with like a long summary of my first question. Then I'm going to toss it to uh, terminal philosophy and then you with and can follow up. Um, so one of my favorite like speeches or topics was Donald Rumsfeld's speech. Now, in a way, it's just a piece of rhetoric, but I think on some level it's more than rhetoric. Um, um, and he gave a speech a while back in the lead up to the Iraq war about known knowns, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I think history he actually stole this from some. Uh, I think NASA or something like that with, with respect to like space exploration was actually the context he got this from or rocket exploration. Um, and a lot of history to me is the second, if not third category. And it's literally lost to history. For example, I, vi- I like histories. I-, I visited Egypt. And one of the primaries I did was the fascination with uh, ancient uh, history of that kind of ancient Egypt, which is very old, older than much of that old in the Greeks. It was in front of the Sphinx. I've overheard Two, two, two English tourists, same as me, um, talking about saying this, this, this is older than the mainstream Egyptologists say it is. They say it's only a few thousand years old. People like Graham Hancock and Plato, for that matter, think it's like 10,000 years old, older than they know. Um, so that's that's like an example of something that's just lost to history. You know, we don't know. There's things that are just, it's just we don't have much data. We can try to piece together stuff, but all the paper records are gone, you know, like and so forth. Um, you think about the U.S. where Britain lost, went went to history. We'd lose all our our paper records. All that was left was our stone buildings. I mean, how how much of a history of the American could you tell, or Britain could you tell, just based on what's written in stone? Not that much. And it, for example, like one third of Aristotle's works are estimated to be lost. Um, so it might be possible to have a history of the World War One, World War Two, or the Civil War, something that's close. But, but but see for me the further you go back the less records we have and it seems to me we're just sort of piecing together um, um, limited amounts of stories and 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 we get into sort of other problems which are not just the history but like metaphor versus uh, literal history some history might just be myth so terminal can we ever get around the missing or lack of data problem especially as the farther we go back in history. Uh, are we like Hayek's example of looking under one key un, for one's keys under the lamp when the whole dark, dark, dark parking lot is empty? TP. Right. Well, uh, first of all, thanks very much for having me on again. Now, this is a really interesting and difficult subject. It would seem that we're grappling with history in both very broad and acute terms. We're also dealing with politics and philosophy and epistemology the application of countless theories in the social sciences and mass psychology via academia and journalism uh, and the entertainment as well as government propaganda. So there's a lot at work here. Uh, To answer your question directly or perhaps a little bit indirectly, I, I believe that the central dilemma with history is that there is either an enormous amount of data for certain eras or events or is there there's hardly anything at all. Um, As I see it, there are two primary methodologies of interpreting history, which can then split off into into other smaller methods. Um, You can either study history to the best of your abilities, meaning examining primary sources or contemporaneous sources in regards to the events of the era in question, determine the strengths of the primary source and its author, uh, his or her motivations for recording such events, Ensuring that your, and this is an important point, that you know you ensure that your analysis takes on more of an anthropological schema, and from there allowing the most relevant and accessible facts, with a lowercase f of course, uh, to and you allow that to be the foundation to which you form a theory, which could either be a political theory, a historical or psychological one, or even something that E. Michael Jones calls meta history, where you're combining history and philosophy to then explain uh, large subjects like human nature, a commonality between societies throughout time, uh, 
or to predict a trajectory of civilizations much like Hegel or Spengler. But uh, to answer your question, uh, no, I don't think that um, much can be known as far as Hayek's uh, thought experiment goes. You know, when you mentioned earlier that you had visited Egypt, because there is so little known with, you know, a high degree of certainty about the ancient Egyptian civilization, well, then, of course, that opens up all sorts of um, ambiguities to take hold. And from there, all sorts of things, different methodologies and schools of thought emerge. I mean, on the one hand, you have sort of the academic elite, like at Harvard and Brown and, and the Egyptologists of, you know, of uh, prestigious academia, which have their theories, of course. But then again, due to this uh, nebulous and arbitrary foundation of Egyptian history in general, well, that allows other things from the entertainment industry like uh, ancient aliens or or sort of uh, a different authors like Graham Hancock who have very different theories that, you know, these, these structures and, so and societies were much older than the mainstream academia would have you believe. So, yeah, it's a bit of a mess. And um, just real quickly, I'll say that the other method, of course, of uh, constructing a grand theory or um, uh, analyzing history is uh, is you you are constructing a theory prior to the project of gathering uh, historical data. Uh, say, for example, a young secular feminist gal from Portland is sent off to her first semester in college, and she attends a world history class. Well, I mean, due to the high circulation of media hysteria about how awful some right-wing people are and, you know, the election of Donald Trump, various conflicts in the Middle East, as well as a sort of a cultural left-wing entertainment apparatus that more or less supports her views that she likely adopted over time by spending time at, you know, coffee shops and skate parks and farmer's markets and so forth. She likely already obtains a theory of how to interpret past events. She's superimposing her views or theories on history, you know, and the same could be said for rural people of the Western United States. Uh, their theories and impressions of history come from the folksy wisdom passed down on the farm, uh, country music, patriotism, uh, rural aesthetics, and so on and so forth. But I'll, I'll leave my first answer at that. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you could in principle be wrong about things you have loads of information today i mean tp points out you have almost too much information i mean uh we probably don't know yet but let's say in 10 years time january the 6th it's like well maybe but then there's there's a whole host of massively contradictory accounts um which ones do we use which stones don't we use um so I suppose you could say, well, if you were on this scene, you could say, yes, that was that definitely took place. But then the question is, well, how much information do we need to say that something happened or not? Um, that's kind of an open question. I suppose then it then gets into. Because the purpose of history will then sort of um, generate, as it were, the um, the standard that you you require to to reach to be sort of considered a his, truthful historical knowledge. Uh, and I would agree as well, um, TP, you know, depending on what your prior theory is, is going to determine which pieces of information you use and how you use them. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole gamut of issues. I don't think they're insurmountable. I would agree that they need to be recognized. Uh, I'm not against history, and I think it's impossible not to do history. In some ways, we have to construct some kind of theory of the past um but i do think i do think we have to sort of make a recognition that some of the stuff is we just don't know which is the sort of we don't know and we know we don't know it's an unknown unknown and there's also there's also like like for example the city of of troy for example that was sort of a legend it became i think archaeologists probably found it or think they found it so there's there's sort of these interesting things about ancient history um and and I, I presume there's tons of lost little histories out there, like Roanoke Island out in the early settler colony of the English. You know, that's that's another thing for conspiracy theorists to come in. Um, so I'm not saying I'm not saying we shouldn't do 
history. That's the, that's the first thing I want to stress. Where I think we have to do history. I think in some ways all all social science is dependent on history. Because even like social science data is just historical data. You know, Mitch Hedberg has a joke. Here's the picture of me when I'm younger. Every picture of you is when you were younger. Um, so those are my overall first comments and first question. Um, but I do think we have to recognize there might be a parking lot that's empty. We just don't know what it, what it look, necessarily looks like. Um, so now of the data we have, I think we have the propaganda problem. Um, and it's quite clear that uh, official sources have lied or given info which is false. Now, this is, of course, related to epistemology, what is truth. But if, if we get beyond those and we say have an idea of what truth is, um, we can say, well, these things are false. Um, and Swift and I have done a podcast, for example, on conspiracy theories, as well as the origins of the coronavirus early on um, and things like that. Uh, uh, I, Alex Berenson, ex-New York Times reporter, um, he, he's been coming to turn to a vaccine and uh, lockdown skeptic, has made continuous updates. The New York Times hasn't uh, addressed the Wuhan lab leak. Um, this is just a re- relatively recent example. But I think there's lots of other historical examples. You know, when I was in college, I had studied something on World War One. I, I was reading to Gar, I think Telegraph. I forget the Brit- whatever British newspaper was telling the history. Um, and I was appalled at how awful and sort of propagandistic the coverage of it. I mean, they had like just like killed, the, you know, it was obviously. And during the Civil War, as Tom Lorenzo points out, uh, it wasn't formal censorship, but you couldn't use the federal mail unless you were approved newspaper, more or less. Uh, and if you use private couriers, it was hard to do. Your, your your readership would just fall apart, sort of what Facebook did. So these are events that if we all we have is newspapers tell the past, uh, are we just sort of getting the New York Times version of history? You know, because like and, and like, are we just getting the elite theory of history? I mean, are we really getting the more folksy view? And this is actually one of the new left ideas, although the new the left is now somewhat the ruling class anyway. Um, um, so, so, so TP, um, what do you make of, you know, issues of propaganda? Like if, so if all the official sources that we have, it's New York times or whatever, you know, we're not going to get the Breitbarts of the 1860s, which I presume they had existed local newsletters. Um, we're not going to get, let alone sites, which are even more fringe. Um, so we're not going to get, you know, if all we had was a New York times to tell the 2020 election or the like Wuhan, well, I think we'd have problems and I think we both would would recognize that. TP? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, propaganda is another huge problem and variable in terms of historical analysis. Uh, you know, personal social biases and governmental motivations tend to be the problem for the historian. Um, you know, and this, uh, not so much for propaganda, but even personal biases and cultural biases even go all the way back to Herodotus. Todd from the Praise of Folly podcast and I often discussed uh, in private the validity of Herodotus in the context of the academic left. Uh, because Herodotus had a fairly mythological interpretation of history, he is often sometimes thrown out entirely from Western historical discourse. Well, you know, just because Herodotus' Herodotus's work sometimes includes, you know, talking snakes, that doesn't mean you dispose of him entirely when military history is concerned between various Greek city-states and so forth. I mean, he, he was a contemporaneous source, you know, so you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater type of a thing. You know, it would be better for the historian that regardless of their personal backgrounds and beliefs that they treat historical inquiry almost like a lawyer would be treating a court case. You know, what can actually be provable, uh, what cannot be provable, and, you know, is there a spectrum of culpability or credit that can be attributed to individuals for playing their part in historical events. Um, you know, it certainly goes without saying that although history is a social science, you know, it's not a science in the way that astrophysics or chemistry are sciences. Uh, history does not have the benefit of interfacing with logic or axiomatic deductions. So the, the good historian, I would argue, needs to spend perhaps even half of his career, half of his or her career going back to the beginning, you know, probably around the time of Herodotus and work their way through the centuries, verifying for themselves what are credible primary and secondary sources and, you know, having a very skeptical eye, being highly on guard for propagandistic, uh, you know, 
history storytelling because, you know, I mean, even this is especially a problem in the modern era. Um, I remember reading part of an autobiography by Robert McNamara, and he was more or less with very interesting, abstract and abstruse language trying to distance himself from the role that he played in basically exacerbating the Vietnam conflict. So this, I just remember, you know, he, he's just trying to, trying his best to sort of absolve himself of sort of the, the sins of the United States in Vietnam when, you know, at the time he, he was sort of, uh, you know, egging on the Johnson administration to ramp up, you know, the number of political advisors and sending more assets. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll think I'll leave it at that. Sorry, it sounds like I'm, uh, sounds like I'm breaking up a little bit. I'll, I'll just reiterate some of that real quickly. Um, but you know, I just remember reading a, uh, an autobiography by Robert McNamara and just talking about his role during the Vietnam conflict and how, you know, he was trying to basically absolve himself of some of, you know, the way that things went down in Vietnam for the United States. And so that to me seems like a fairly clear example of propagandistic history telling, um, you know, and whereas if, if there's a, it's hard for historians now to publish outside of the academic elite circles because that is sort of the one and only uh, established community of historians who are able to fact check themselves and put their work under rigorous scrutiny. However, uh, as I'm sure we'd all agree, the problem with modern uh, social sciences is that it is basically highly biased towards the cultural left wing. And so it's, you know, it would be difficult to get a more, uh, you know, conservative or right wing interpretations of historical events nowadays because there is such a, the cultural left wing has such a monopoly on, um, on the social sciences in the academy. On the, uh, Tim's point, respect to if you just have the New York Times to decide what happened in uh, the 2020 election, for example, you would get a somewhat one sided uh, view of things. Uh, I think this is where it, you, you've got to do some sort of, um, well, if you mentioned before, TPO like anthropology or some sort of psychology. It's just like, what is the motivation of this uh, person who's writing it? Uh, I don't know too much about Herodotus, but he certainly doesn't seem to be writing to sell like newspapers. Um, it, it's, it seems from what I've looked at that newspapers are a singularly unreliable source for many pieces of information historically. Well, because well, what's their incentive? Their incentive is to, you know, write something that sells. And if you can identify an audience for for whatever your view that you're putting out there is, then you're going to write it. Um, so you, you've got to sort of distinguish that. So, I mean, for example, like... Um, Bede in his history of England I mean does he really have much reason to sort of make up the uh the Saxon invasions I don't think so he was a monk is there any particular reason why that was the case what he may have done but you don't seem to have that same sort of um uh, psychological uh, or financial motivation for make something up which didn't happen in the same way you might have with uh newspapers so I, I suppose I'm uh, you've, you've got to look at and obviously you do you know, who, who's saying it and why are they saying it although that said I would say that um, a lot of modern uh, history especially what ancient stuff I've come across have basically assumed that any written source is always always lies uh, and uh, just looks at the archaeological evidence but then the problem is well, it's very difficult to interpret archaeological evidence without any written sources so it's quite difficult to know what things actually are or what things actually mean. Uh, this is this has come up with say with the Saxon invasions, for example, in England. Um, so yes, uh, newspapers are bad. Tim, I would agree that newspapers are bad, but as Moldbug pointed out once, that like take Wikipedia. Um, what counts? It's sort of like a circular thing. Is what counts as a good source on Wikipedia? And it's interesting to go even look at like the review of the Federalists. What Wikipedia will say about a fairly militoast web, you know, normie conservative-ish website, The Federalist. Um, it has sort of all sorts of things. Um, there was a French historian that once, for example, that wanted to throw away the first-hand accounts 
um, and just write an encyclopedia. He was from like the 1800s. I think he might have been a Jacobin of some variety. And just write. He he's looked through the you know the first-hand material. He's decided what it is, and now he's going to th- just throw away all the first-hand accounts. It's a very sort of Randian uh, maneuver here. Um, um, so I want to have a sort of part B of this question. Um, you know, with societies like England, Britain, whatever, uh, even Germany, United States, it's a historical West here, um, and even ancient Greek, uh, we have a sort of idea of libertas or liberty or some idea of uh, some degree of freedom of some variety. Again, you can get into the, very much into the weeds of this. Um, but with societies that are more closed, uh, in modern day society, uh, you have like North Korea or historical or East Germany, uh, where there's a cl- there might have been records, but it's not quite clear that those records were kept very honestly. Well, they might actually be kept very honestly or too honestly, ironically enough. Uh, but but they could just get you know they were not they're not held in the public degree. Um, there was strong you know speech codes or informal or uh, unfor- uh, formal or informal speech codes. You have Stalin famously writing people out of history as well. And more ancient societies, uh, you know, some of these sort of these emperor god societies, you know, what exactly can we know about them? These are more closed off societies. I mean, there are relevant Sparta in some degree, from my understanding, um, is something like not quite like that. Uh, I don't want to go off in territory to not understand, but I'm, 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 there are certain societies that are like that. This these historical, you know, empire type societies. Um, what do you make of those societies, TP? How can we tell the history of those societies where we have sort of limited archaeological knowledge, and then again we have the, the source material, which is a mixture of propaganda and bad data and uh, 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 things like that. I'll just one more thing to add. There was an East German historian that had to tell the history of World War to what they call the Great Powder Corps. And after the Berlin Wall fell, he said, oh, my, Adam Tooze brings up this guy. He said, oh, all my data is, was a lot of my data was wrong because I was using the official sources to, to generate troop accounts and they were all uh, purposely propagandized. So I always found that tidbit sort of interesting. Uh, TP? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, yes, uh, places like North Korea or, um, you know, the former East Germany or even anecdotally places like Turkmenistan are very very closed off societies and unfortunately they're probably some of the worst and most battered victims of a historical analysis because you you know here in you know in quote unquote like freer societies in the west like the United States or Canada or Great Britain or Germany France Spain so on and so forth these places that have a long academic tradition you know it's it's one thing in those societies to just deal with personal and cultural biases that can possibly have negative impacts on historical analysis. I think it's an entirely different behemoth, I think you would agree, when a government, something the size of a government or that a, a political entity of that size has complete and total reign over what history is allowed to be published. So I, I think it's in a completely different tier of um, of a historical thought, um, because you know, even with even with problems in the West, I mean, at least many people are able to tell that you know something is sketchy or something is fishy in the way that newspapers and websites and uh, news media will report on things like, say, the coronavirus or death tolls or you know, uh, you know, at least there's that option, at least there's that dynamic. Uh, or at least there's that variable to work with. Uh, you know, however, in places like Turkmenistan, as far as I'm aware, I have heard this anecdotally on on a uh, I forget the name of the guy's YouTube channel, but he traveled to all 196 countries, and when he had gone to Turkmenistan, the capital there, um, you know, like their archives or something like that. I mean, it's just like it, it's it's almost entirely of the glorification of the state and the current ruler, and so there's no um, I wouldn't even say that there's not even it's not that there's no variety I mean that's of course true as well but there's no um, opposing sources as to what uh, you know what the government has been up to for the last 50 years or so has been wrong or you know the relationship it has with other states has been 
you know, uh, negative or nefarious or things like that. So I think that is probably the most sinister level of a historical um, analysis when a state is in control of the archives. And I mean, yes, of course, you could say offhand that most uh, land grant four year universities here in the United States are supported by tax dollars, but the government can't just go in and just destroy archives at a uh, at a four year land grant university's library. I mean, it, it's uh, you know the the university still owns those, and uh, you know it, it, there's no absolute control of the state. I mean, you can even go into the uh, I forget the name of the location in or the name of the building in Washington D.C., but there's like you know the the Library of Archives or something like that. But you know there, that's a famous that's a world famous location for studying history and you know especially you know American history. Um, you know there's all sorts of uh, you know documents from other historians and other just personal accounts from people of different backgrounds and uh, and political orientations. So. Yeah, I would say that while newspapers are at this point, I would say a totally horrendous source of information, um, state propaganda coming from the loudspeaker or from uh, you know newsletters that are hand out on the corner, probably in Pyongyang or something like that, are about a hundred times worse as well. So yeah, I would say that uh, historical analysis that's in complete control of the state, that's probably, I mean, I would say that that's probably the most ahistorical method or a historical version of uh, of interpreting history. On more recent uh, matters relating to that, um, we, we should be glad of the Wayback Machine. Mentioning the coronavirus, there was uh, reports that uh, lots of the, um, I think it was the New York Times, amongst others, were doctoring their old articles when they were basically saying that the lab leak theory was evil right wing conspiracy to change the language slightly to make it look as if, oh, well, no, we just don't think it's likely at the moment, rather than, oh, no, these evil people think it's going to happen. Therefore, it must be wrong. Um, so when it comes to the Internet archives, um, the Wayback Machine is uh, is our friend uh, when it comes to this, because one of the advantages physical documents, you can't really amend them very easily. And whilst it's true that uh, there may be certain documentation that will be deliberately ignored or suppressed, I don't think at the moment in the West you've got the situation they're going to burn documents, which is at least good if civilization lasts for another 150 years or so, because then you can at least look at them. Uh, so, yeah, um, when it comes to um, from North Korea, to Manistan, etc., you don't really... Um, so, whilst I'm not a huge fan of the West, it, in that sense, it's relatively better than Turkmenistan, and that's relatively uncontroversial. Tim? Yes, I, I relatively, I put air quotes. Um, and that is one of the benefits of non-digital history. You can put it in paper, better yet, in stone. Um, if you, you know, if you want to, want to be discovered by the ancient aliens in 2,000 years from now, write how you built your buildings in stone, and that will solve all problems. Put little diagrams next to it. Um, they should have done that for the Great Pyramids if they did. Um, but back to more sort of less offhand comments. Um, that was one of the things that in the 1984 Orwell's book. Now, keep in mind, Orwell wrote this book, I think, in the 30s. I forget when he precisely wrote which one of his novels. He wrote the sort of doctoring history up earlier, which is, to me, um, quite quite uh, prophetic, uh, you know, sort of deleting history to make the party. Uh, everything was for the party. Um, but that, that closes out the propaganda uh, section. Um, and now I'm going to move into the third question, which I'd say is if we have well, take we take the data what we have um, and all things included, I think a historian now has to sort of move in to make a narrative of some degree, the degree, maybe not a theory, but at least a narrative um, to write a book. Um, you can try to do a narrative history, um, but even that sort of ends up looking like a, a history of, of, of a kind. Uh, I recently read a a, a book um, called uh, oh, I, I, I wrote the name down um, Human Smoke. It was written, recommended by Moldbug and Thaddeus Russell, but it was a revisionist history of World War, uh, the lead up to World War II. And the author just takes newspaper clippings of various, you know, fairly factual events and just sort of arranges them in such a way to sort of show this sort of this sort of, you know, the United States was, and Britain were sort of stoking a fight. Um, in a way, it's a very interesting revisionist version of history. It's actually written by a Quaker, of all people. Um, this is not written by some far right person by any 
uh, uh, means. So even so, I found that book to be which revisionist history goes into my third question. Um, one of the things if you get into enough of a topic um, to the extent that we have the facts available and they exist uh, and they're we can take the facts. And we can construct lots of different narratives. So take the U.S. Civil War. There's, there's whole schools of Civil War historiography. Um, you can have there's sort of different schools of historiography. There's the Southern apologists. There's the Northern revanchists. There's I might different. They, they get called different names. I think World War One and World War Two are similar topics, where there's just warehouses full of history books on the topic. Because uh, part of the reason because they're so close and they're so formative. Um, but we get all these different theories and then or histories and narratives. How can we say we have the history when you have Jaffa and Tom Lorenzo and, you know, the uh, uh, various authors and actually Grant's own narratives are oftentimes used as a key source of you were talking about, I think, McNamara's narrative. Uh, you know, what's what's to make of all these different competing theories of history? And when we say the history uh, TP. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting question as well. I think uh, the reason why there are so many competing narratives, especially for historical subjects that go perhaps even as far back as Napoleon and the French Revolution, is because by that point we're well outside of the scope of antiquity and there is far less ambiguity to deal with. However, what makes this interesting is that when you go into historical subjects, let's say from the French Revolution till 2021 nowadays, well, there actually is a lot of information to work with. In fact, there's so much data to work with that anyone, uh, regardless of their motivations or their backgrounds or proclivities, I mean, they, they are more or less, um, I mean, you know, they, they make a convincing case out of a body uh, of information. So, you know, you can have a conservative interpretation of the French Revolution or you can have a liberal interpretation of the French Revolution. Uh, you can have you know revisionist histories of World War II, of Vietnam, Korea, uh, you know the Spanish Civil War, uh, so on and so forth because the I guess once you have as you said like warehouse loads of information for one uh, conflict or one era or event, well, then anyone can take advantage of that vast, nebulous, uh, you know, collection of sources, and they can um, pick the information that they want and uh, form a narrative from that or form a theory from it. That's not to say that every theory or every historical analysis is sinister by nature. It's just that there's actually few historians that um, do this, you know, encyclopedic effort of looking at historical events anthropologically and sort of, you know, th I mean, th that, that's a much more Herculean effort rather than, you know, imposing some of your predetermined impressions on a historical event because, um, you know, most, I would say most left-wing academics look at the French Revolution, for example, as the one of the great liberal events of history, which I think that portion is certainly true. Uh, you know, this is when people went from subjects to citizens of a nation, and then of course, you know, Napoleon, uh, you know, basically creates a monarchy from that. But you know, it, it's it's what created the dichotomy between left and right. It's what made uh, people feel a part of something greater than themselves, i.e., the nation. Um, you know, however, many of the Catholic traditionalists are the ones who took down Napoleon, and this is something that, or you know, at least the the government of Paris at the time, and that's something that's rarely discussed. And so, you know, a liberal academic might hear that, and he or she might immediately be on the, you know, might be immediately skeptical of you making that claim, and like, well, what's your motivation for saying that? And so, you know, it's unfortunate that. There's so many personal biases and cultural biases involved with historical analysis. And another, you know, I mean, I would say another reason why there's so many competing narratives, too, is because, I mean, our society is becoming much more uh, hyper individualized. And so there, you know, from there, you kind of meet people on the Internet who have the same uh, 
more or less you know worldviews as you, same interpretations of historical events as you, and then from there, you and that group will form their own uh, historical interpretations of things. So, um, sorry, it sounds like I'm cutting out, but uh, I'll just repeat this just for um, just to uh, trying to keep things uh, understandable. Another reason why I think that um, history is uh, you know is is such a difficult uh, thing to deal with is because society is becoming so hyper individualized and you know in a hyper individualized society with the internet you end up meeting people uh, on the internet with your similar views and you some, somewhat form of you, know, you, you form something of an echo chamber and then that echo chamber produces its own narratives and memes and so on and so forth so it can be uh, fairly frustrating there um, just to add to that too you know I mean cultural and in vogue issues tend to make uh, a genuine theory difficult to construct on good faith you know I uh, you know, in addition to the propaganda problem that you know we were just talking about from the governmental level, I would, I would also argue that there's historical propaganda coming from the entertainment industry. Um, you know, the entertainment industry exacerbates this by manufacturing a, you know, a carefully calculated image of certain historical events or uh, peoples of different political orientations. I mean, just for example, you know, World War II movies, as an example. I mean, their goal is fairly simple, and it's usually, you know, to paint most or all Germans as just evil people, and all those of the Allied nations are just unquestionable saints. And you know, and this is the central thesis of most World War II movies. It shows this this attempt to draw a clear line between good and evil. Um, the last thing I'll say, just in regards to your uh, to your question, is that. There is a interesting English philosopher whose name is R.G. Collingwood. I think it's Robert or Robin something Collingwood. Forgive me that I don't know his middle name, but he was an English philosopher in the 20th century who died in 1943, and he wrote a book called *The Idea of History*. And it's uh, more or less a philosophical work on the concept of on how the concept of history has evolved from Herodotus to the 20th century. And basically, as I remember it, Collingwood believes that history is a discipline in which in which uh, one must relive the past in his or her mind. Uh, you know, they must um, rigorously study a historical event or era. Uh, or even a historical zeitgeist for that matter, and try their best to place themselves in the mental circumstances of that time. And from there, you uh, you are more or less um, you know, interpreting history from that psychological realm. Now, he, he got a bunch of – he's received a lot of uh, criticism for this, but I think um, he is one of the more interesting figures from Great Britain, uh, one of the more interesting British academics who – is doing this Hegelian sort of meta history type of a thing where you're combining history and philosophy. You're seeing if there is a common thread throughout history that sort of guides and gives a general trajectory to different societies. Um, but that was that was basically the thesis of his book, the idea of history. So um, I won't be too verbose beyond here. I think uh, I agree with a lot of what you say, TP. All I uh, focus on is I think when it comes to history, uh, especially with more recent stuff, I think there's actually a lot of agreement on what happened and when it happened. The question is more why it happened and what does it mean? Uh, whereas in um, older historical events, there's more, uh, more of a question of what actually happened and when did it happen? So, I don't know it very well, but there's the arguments with, regarding the Egyptian chronology uh, of um, there's the normal one. And then there's David Roll with the new chronology. These are the types of um, debate that you don't have sort of post French Revolution. Or at least if you do, they're probably within days of each other. Um, so I think the, 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 the question is, in a way, is not necessarily what happened, but why does it happen and what does it mean? Uh, and that's where history needs to come into conversation with philosophy and, and other things like that. Um, as an aside, I haven't heard of Collingwood's book on that sort of meta history thing. I've always thought it would be good if anyone did at the start of history book, just write their methodology at the beginning. So you understand explicitly what they're doing and how they're going about their history. 
um, because then it'd be easier to sort of pass what they're doing. Um, because a lot of the time you read and you go, well, that sounds reasonably plausible, but how did you actually go about doing this? Uh, which I always thought might have been an, an interesting thing to do. There was one medieval one that did that. I can't remember what it's called. He outlines his, sort of, his particular methodology at the beginning and how he approaches it. Um, but that, I think, would be to the benefit of, uh, hist- of, of, of history in general. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Tim. I'm going to follow up on this um, before I get to my final uh, uh, thing here. Uh, history, to me... Is relevant. I think I don't think you can. Do, I don't think a civilization can do it without it, or do it without some version of history, or any kind of air quote complex civilization of some sort. You need to have some um, idea of where you came from, at least from the last hundred years. Um, but it seems like the uh, as the further uh, are we are, is it you said about the events being swift and just now like he's up to the French Revolution. Um, will this be a case where in a hundred years everyone will say, well? They'll start redebating the U.S. Civil War, and well, in a hundred years they'll start. It, let's imagine, maybe in the 1600s they were debating. He said, "Oh, did Charlemagne really exist?" or things like that. So, each, each, as is it sort of like a revolving door? Are we just going to always just have a sort of local, uh, parochial neighborhood version of history that we know very well and it's that's very relevant? Um, and as far as we go back, it just becomes much more opaque. Um, and if if that is the case, if that is the case, um, what exactly what exactly is history? I mean, take I mean, take family history to me is sort of a localized version of history, which is interesting. And like, you know, after a certain number of generations back, I have we have no clue where my name is. Uh, and that's probably the truth for many people. Some people might be able to trace them back much longer. Um, but, you know, what amount of history will just be lost? And I'm going to toss this question uh, back to both of you, like, you know, uh, and this is, we don't even know the denominator of this sort of, of equation, um, but, you know, of relevant history, do you, you know, what, you know, what amount of history do you think is out there? TP, <clears throat> and what about is lost? Well, I think uh, with your question is like, is there, an, is there even such thing or can there be such thing as like a history, an established history with a capital H? And I think that that can be um, established up to a certain point um, as, you know, I mean, we can agree that things that, you know, even secular left-wing historians agree that someone either like Christ or someone like him certainly existed, you know, that uh, Hannibal fought for Carthage and that Rome, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll use this term loosely, but, you know, civilized parts of Europe, um, you know, obviously through conquest and bloodshed, but, uh, and then, you know, and then things like, you know, the existence of uh, Henry VIII and things like the French Revolution, I think a general history with the capital H can exist. Um, however, now in the modern era, we have the problem of like, there's, it's kind of like the analogy of there's like far too many cooks in the kitchen and many people are self-appointed experts of history and this might just be someone with a smartphone and very strong political and social and philosophical opinions. And so I think that as we go deeper into the future, uh, assuming that technology plays this role that it does in society and either has this exponential influence or just has this increasing influence on society, then what will happen is that there will simply be so much data, I use again with the lowercase d, There'll be so much information and gossip and history out there that I think as time goes on, it will be more and more difficult to determine what is history because, you know, even if you go on to YouTube and you just simply observe the the uh, the disagreements between like Jimmy Dore and the Young Turks. Well, both of these channels are self-described progressives, but they're, you know, at each other's throats over um, various issues like uh, Medicare for All during the coronavirus pandemic and, you know, Shank Uger receiving millions of dollars from the DNC, so on and so forth. I mean, maybe that's not the best example, but I suppose what I'm trying to illustrate here is that, you know, and hundreds of thousands and millions of people watch that material – there will be so much information and there will be such 
there will be so little there there will no there will be no supermajority as to what is agreed upon as a general history of something. Again, I think that can apply to things like to subjects older, you know, like uh, some things from antiquity, some things from the medieval era, and the early modern era, and the Renaissance. But you know, now that technology plays the role that it has. Well, I think that that is the big uh, – that's one of the big problems that we're facing now. Um, so I think for the time being that Nietzsche will probably become more and more correct throughout time as in, there's no history with a capital H. There's just an endless ocean of interpretations. And the last thing I'll say on this comment too is that I think Swithin made a great point in terms of – uh, most people, relatively speaking, tend to agree on what uh, events have happened, you know, as far as the 20th century goes. Um, the, the big debate now is that, you know, perhaps this is a call for a return to philosophy within historical analysis, is that many people disagree on why certain things happen. You know, why, how could Germany have possibly, you know, um, elected Hitler, or how could... Uh, how could Great Britain have done this to India, so on and so forth. So that will be, I suppose, the next great project for um, historical academics is to determine why things happen as opposed to the material realities of them. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it back to you guys. I think, yeah, it will become increasingly difficult to get uh, a narrative of what, what actually happened. Although I suppose you could claim that, that really would have been the case historically if you would have had as much information as we do now um, in the Middle Ages, for example. That said, of course, they do seem to be relatively more homogenous societies, so you might expect uh, somewhat less conflicting views as to why and what's happened and for what reason. I, I do, though, think uh, TP's point about philosophy is interesting. I mentioned it earlier, and I think this is true of a lot of things. Uh, you, what's really needed is um, a reintegration of many disciplines and a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, now, by that, I mean, I don't mean getting a specialist in one area, a specialist in another area and uh, working with them together to try and come up with with a project. It's well, no you need a broader education in various areas so that you can better understand and use um, the data accordingly. So, I mean, this is not, um, you can't just go out and measure using numbers what's happened historically. You need some actual economic theory. Otherwise, you can have no idea what's going on because you can't just go and, and um, measure data because all you end up doing is being a historicist which doesn't really give you any particular information about why anything took place well you know it was high taxation or Jean-Baptiste Colbert he banned the sale of silk outside of France and the silk industry did well so it was probably good for France it's like well that's the bad economics so I suppose though if you're going to go for a broader approach then you're going to get even more disagreements uh, which I suppose is really, really cool to do philosophy well. Um, that would be my sort of uh, brief uh, assessment of the situation. I think philosophy in some ways is needed for all subjects. Um, I think philosophy needs to be put back uh, more on its, it, its throne instead of these sort of empiricist historical things. Uh, as your, your point about economics of just having, you know, you find some event, uh, say the rising or the exodus of gold or some gold mine and you just sort of infer some theory out of it. I think Marx did this roughly um, with his one of his histories uh, uh, with, with the outflows of gold which sort of is a happenstance. Um, so yeah, I think philosophy needs to be applied. Uh, I, th I think that we did a topic on taboos with a TP and I think that's somewhat related to scientism. Um, history done as a sort of Suedo scientific method uh, uh, is definitely a problem. So I do think philosophy needs to be added. Um, and, and to bring up my final point here, you know, wh it, why why did I why did I have this why did I do this topic? Uh, why did I want to sort of interview TP as well as discuss this with Swithin? Is, is I think I think history history is I, as I say I keep saying this I'm not against history I think it has to be done. Um, but uh, the, the whole question of learning from history. Is the more interesting question here? You know, you know, why do people read history books? And you can read them because you just find them entertaining. 
understanding, for example. That's a reason to read history books. Um, but there is this ethos that you, you sort of learning from history. I, I, you know, the only thing we learn from history is we don't learn from history. Um, but but I think I think you should, I think part of my part of my part of my role here is to strengthen the sort of philosophers approach um, uh, with the sort of forcing historians to hedge on their data uh, to say, well, if you're unclear about your data. Then if you're going to use it to your philosophical theories, well, how can we really test this if we don't know about, you know, all the data, for example, um, that because the problem, which is the point that Swithin just brought about the economics example. And Nassim Taleb in one of his books made a great point, although he didn't follow himself, as most people don't follow their own advice when it comes to themselves and their own crisis they find. Uh, uh, and Swith, we did we did an episode on this, um, but Taleb has this great point about maps. You know, he said, you know, if you're in a ship and he said, oh, we lost the map, but we have a map of London instead of New York. You want to get off the ship of of New York Harbor instead of Singapore Harbor or something like you get get off the ship. You get a different ship. It's better to use no map. Um, um, So I think I think at times, you know, maybe the North Koreans actually have a better guide of human nature because, well, maybe not. They not won't go that far. Um, But but if you have no history, in some ways, you you're not. You can get out underneath of certain things, although that comes with problems, too. That comes with problems, too. Uh, so my final comment is sort of history versus philosophy. Uh, I'll leave it to both of you guys. Um, you know, what what is the better guide? Of course, the easy answer is to say, well, both of them have their strengths and the merits, uh, the strengths and demerits. Uh, but, you know, do you think do you think historians should be more hedged or philosophers should be more hedged? I'll pass it to TP and then Swithin can make comments. Yeah, that that's an interesting one. I mean, I will say, I, I in a way, um, you kind of already outlined the, the the dilemma in general. I think obviously they are both you know, deeply fascinating and necessary, and should you know remain at the academy as long as there's a civilization to support the academy. Um, however, I think the modern problem is that the empiricists more or less are enjoying the monopoly of publications. And that uh, philosophy combined with history is something that is not um, is not so acceptable. I mean, for example, um, you know, Hegelian-esque interpretations of history are almost seen as like you know mystical interpretations of history to perhaps the materialist, secular, left-wing academic, which you know. Okay, fine, but when there's hardly any publications like that being allowed into, um, or you know, it's not that they're not even being allowed. It's just it's just that it's not being done, and so it, I'm, you know, academia is just as subject to trends as any other parts of society, I would argue, and so, you know, uh, there needs to be some sort of area carved out in historical analysis where philosophy is accepted to explain perhaps human nature's you know human nature in in certain societies during certain times whereas like you know empiricism can't really interface with um the zeitgeist of you know carthage or rome or the assyrians or anything like that and so this is where we need things like philosophy and psychology to help explain these things otherwise you know it's like trying to fit a you know a square peg into a round hole type of a thing you need another tool to help you uh determine that um but um yeah i think i'll i think i'll leave my closing comment at that when it comes to philosophy want to go to a situation where we have to sort of start everything from first principles and create an elaborate sort of single methodology for everything um but i think it's more of a case to recognize okay what is history and then therefore given our conception of history what then is entailed by the subject matter and you will need theory of some description now how you generate your theory is another question but the the attempt to do theory free history is impossible now uh, again, the question theory is, is an interesting question, but uh, pure sort of empiricism is is just um, is faulty. The, the the problem with many disciplines in economics as well is um, the success of uh, the natural sciences, in particular physics, engineering, etc., has just put sort of uh, mathematical prediction 
at the heart of absolutely everything. I mean, it doesn't even need to mean anything. But it just means all well, the model predicts it. It doesn't matter. This goes back to sort of Milton Friedman with his positive economics. Um, it doesn't even have to make any sense logically. Well, if it just has reliable predictions, well, then it works. And that kind of pragmatism, empiricism just doesn't yield any insight. Um, so I, I think what's kind of required is and this may have been done. Uh, it probably has in various quarters, but a much more open conversation. What actually is history? And OK, given what we know, what we conceive history to be, how do we go about investigating history and what uh, assumptions, what kind of uh, ways that we have to go about doing this? And then if there's particularly philosophical implications, well, then we do that in that area. And then we can have like a cogent idea of what we're going to do. Then we go out and do it. Um, that would be what I would like to see. Uh, and as I, say, as I said before, I'd like that up, up front at the beginning of, of work so you know what they're doing. Uh, and so then, you know, if you think the empirical stuff, make, the execution of it makes sense, oh, okay, that's probably. But then if you think methodology is wrong, but then you can take aspects of it that you think are right in the way it's written. Um, and I think it'd be more enlightening um, all, all round. Uh, but I, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Any final comments, Tim? Uh, no, I think this was a great, uh, great conversation. Um, I you, do I have a theory or a tell us of why I'm doing this? Um, I, I just a general problem with history. I mean, I like history, um, but the, the, you know, take the Civil War for or the American Revolution. After you read about f three books on it, you know, the sort of idea that there is a history falls away, and, and you start getting, and you start going to look at the mythology of histories. You start. You know, you know, what exactly really happened in the past is a kind of mystery. Uh, and that, that's that's and that that's, that's those are relatively recent events. I mean, we've all been at events that ourselves um, where, you know, family event, whatever. And two different people have two different accounts of the same event. Um, and if you just sort of extrapolate this to larger events. We get problems. Uh, uh, and, and this was one of the things that history at times brought up by socialists, capitalists, paleocons, all sorts of sort of evidence for this theory or, or this in favor of this theory or not in favor of the theory, uh, you know. Um, but then, then people counterattack and say, well, the history is not quite that way. Um, and then they'll say, oh, actually, the history was this way. Um, um, so we are debating over certain facts that might be known. So maybe not, we're totally in the Nietzschean paradigm, so to speak. Um, but if you add in the propaganda, you add in those other problems, we start getting closer to it. Um, um, uh, so I, I do think it's overall, I do think it's un, unavoidable to do some history. Um, but, but, uh, I, again, that, that's, if you want to ask me why, to, not to just to sort of openly attack historians. Uh, it's just to, uh, lay out some of my skepticisms toward them. Actually, my disappointment. I mean, you know, there's that French encyclopedias who wanted to sort of write the history of France and just throw away all the sources. I, I mean, that, if, if his Actually, I don't think mathematical theories actually work this way. Actually, that, even them, I don't even understand. They have the competing disagreements. But we, I don't think we'll ever be able to do that kind of history. So TP, maybe make a short comment. And Swithin, if you want to add something, I'm finished again. Thanks for doing this. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me as always. This has been a great conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with your initial comment, too, that you know, I, I am fascinated by history. That's one of the things that I studied in college. And, um, you know regardless of whatever is secretly baked into the DNA of any historical work, it's just nice to read history just because um, I think it's not uh, – history and historical thinking is so far outside of our modern-day public consciousness that it's almost like an underground holistic thing to do now. I would say the same uh, – I would say the same for philosophy in many regards, but um, – the musician uh, Ian McKay from Minor Threat once said that, you know, all art is political. Well, I think you could probably make the uh, you could probably make the argument that all history is political to some extent or another, whether it's the politics of the author or that there are there's a political theory or implication implied somewhere within the historical work. But um, I'll just say uh, that what is required of a good faith historian is to do your best 
to sort of leave yourself at the door as much as you can and try and try and apply an attorney's uh, methodology on a court case, how you would look at certain um, historical events. And even if it goes against a lot of your politics, just report what is there and then if and when philosophy is required for some historical analysis, whether it's an attempt to explain a cultural zeitgeist of a certain era or maybe a certain individual like a Julius Caesar or a Napoleon or Erwin Rommel, well then uh, go ahead and employ that tool when you need it. But I think, you know, we just need we need less newspapers, we need less um, CGI entertainment in history, and we just we need to kind of go back to having history and philosophy as a two-fisted fighter to take on historical analysis rather than, I think, in vogue cultural hysteria. Uh, yeah, thanks again for having me. Uh, on the uh, use of history, I think one thing is it, it, interesting, but also it's uh, um, if policies or cultural norms have taken place and you know you can it it's or it's an experiment that's already happened so we can find out what the result is and this can inform uh future uh political uh or, or social uh thought so um although he's not a historian he's an anthropologist uh, uh todd's favorite um jd unwin um is um is, is interesting here because you know you can look at various sort of marriage practices and then sort of imply see how they impact society as a whole which would then give us uh insight as to what might be a preferable uh social arrangement there for general functioning of society uh so i i think yeah you, know, you can treat history as just lots of past experiments that we can learn from if we just know what the experiment actually is which is, i suppose is, is, is the difficulty uh, I, i've enjoyed this thanks again joining us tp um, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone for listening. If you have in, uh, enjoyed this, uh, please uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and share with your friends and family. Uh, and if you'd like to contact the show, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow 